Thank you, and you may be seated. Welcome to Calvary Community Church, and uh, thank you for coming today. Again, this will be a whole week of uh, really, as you review the Bible, the events that took place 2,000 years ago. This is the this is the most exciting week of the year for uh, Christians, and uh, hopefully you'll take the uh, uh, sheet that we left in the bulletin for you, the crucifixion chart, that'll allow you to kind of go day by day with the events that are taking place. I'm going to begin by telling a story of a young uh, pastor. He just got out of seminary and he uh, uh, was uh, ready to begin his uh, work and uh, he was told that it will happen from time to time that your mind will go blank when you're preaching and uh, the seminary professor said uh, don't worry it will happen just quote a scripture and you'll just be fine and you'll find that everything will flow and so uh, here he comes to do his first wedding ceremony and uh, he has the bride and groom and the congregation and and uh, everything seems to be going smoothly and then he comes to the place where he's to join the uh, couple together and he forgets the name of the groom and the bride his mind is just blank and so he remembers what he learned in seminary and he says well I just quote a scripture so he said father forgive them for they know not what they do <laughs> okay turn if you will to John's gospel chapter 12 Matthew Mark Luke and John and we'll get started here today this is Palm Sunday. We have here in this wonderful um, Gospel of John the events that lead up to today. We have in verse 1, then Jesus six days before the Passover. You have to realize how significant the Passover is and how we're going to talk about that in just a moment. But Jesus comes to Bethany. Bethany is just on the east side of the Mount of Olives. And when you cross over the top, you're looking west at the city of Jerusalem. It's very, very close. We walked on the road that led down uh, the Mount of Olives all the way down to the base to the Garden of Gethsemane. And the road, of course, begins on the other side of the mountain. And we find here Jesus comes to Bethany. Now he had already been there and he had healed Lazarus or raised him from the dead. That was a notable miracle. He had been dead for four days when Jesus arrived. When Jesus went to the tomb and asked them to roll the stone away from the tomb, they said, no Lord, he stinketh. After four days, you could imagine what the stench would be of the decaying body uh, coming out of the tomb. It's a uh, nice way of saying he stinks after four days. And of course, you know the story. Christ raised him from the dead. And uh, this obviously uh, spread like wildfire throughout Israel. And it says here, he came to Bethany six days before the Passover, where Lazarus, which had been dead whom he raised from the dead so it notes here the miracle had already taken place in John 11 we see Christ raising Lazarus from the dead now he comes back to Bethany six days before the Passover and it says here where Christ rather with Lazarus which had been dead whom he raised from the dead and there they made him a supper and Martha served but Lazarus was one of those that sat at the table with him. Can you imagine what that must have been like? Lazarus had been dead, and now he had been raised from the dead, and now he's sitting at dinner with uh, Jesus and Mary and Martha as uh, uh, they are six days now out from the Passover. I'm going to skip a lot of the passage. I hope you'll read it on your own. But down in verse 9, it says, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there. Uh, the word got out. Jesus is back in Bethany. Uh, Lazarus uh, is raised from the dead. 
And notice, uh, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. People came from everywhere to see Lazarus. They had heard about how he had been dead for four days. And they came to see Lazarus and also, of course, to see Jesus. But the chief priest consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. They wanted to kill Lazarus because this miracle was causing everybody to gravitate around Jesus. Because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and what? Believed on Jesus. So the religious leaders didn't like that. And because many, because of the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead, many believed on Jesus and they went away from the religious teaching of the religious leaders. And so they were very disturbed by this. And so then we find here that on the next day, much people that were come to the feast, that is talking about Passover, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Wow. So here is the event that uh, had been uh, foretold. The Messiah was coming and the crowds had come out now to see Lazarus and they came to see Jesus and here they knew he was there and as he comes over to Jerusalem uh, they, uh, they uh, obviously straw the way uh, with their palm branches exactly like the Bible uh, describes here. Now what is amazing is that if you'll turn back to the book of Zechariah this very event is mentioned long before it ever takes place. Now Zechariah is the next to the last book of the Old Testament. So if you just back up from Matthew, one book you'll be Malachi, the second book will be Zechariah, and we find here Zechariah is an incredible, wonderful uh, book of prophecy about Jesus. <clears throat> and I want you to notice with me in chapter 9 of Zechariah, it has this wonderful prophecy. Zechariah, when he wrote, the temple had been destroyed. Israel had been dis dis dispersed and carried away captive into Babylon. And uh, the Jewish people were very, very discouraged. And so here God gives them some incredible words of encouragement. He says in verse 9 of chapter 9 of Zechariah, page 973, Rejoice greatly. O daughter of Zion. He's now referring to the descendants of those that were listening to Zechariah and his message. And he's talking about those that would be daughters of Zion, those that would be of Jerusalem, that would be living in the future. And he says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold what? Thy king cometh unto thee. That's what happened on Palm Sunday. Here the king was coming. Here Christ was coming. And he's coming down the slopes of the Mount of Olives. And the crowds had gathered because of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. And they wanted to see Lazarus. They wanted to see Christ. And they recognized that this was no ordinary man. And they uh, cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. A messianic title that tells us that Jesus is the Messiah. And it says here, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, which refers to the fact he's sinless. Uh, Jesus Christ was absolutely righteous. The only one in a human body that could be declared that. The equivalent word is righteous. In Romans 3.10 it says, As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. But the king of Israel is righteous. He is God. He's the sinless lamb of God that was coming to take away the sin of the world. Notice it says, secondly, that he's having... He, having salvation. Christ came now bringing salvation to the world by now offering himself up to die on the hill of Calvary as our Savior. It says he came, came lowly, riding upon an ass, upon the colt, the foal of an ass. And so here is that event. As Christ comes down the slopes, he has his disciples go and ask for an ass that had been tied up and just said, tell them that your master has need of him 
and he'll let you borrow the donkey, and here he comes down on the donkey. And by the way, the donkey was uh, uh, the uh, animal that kings would ride on. Throughout the Old Testament, you find that uh, the kings uh, rode on donkeys. Unless they were going to war, then they rode on the horse. And so here Christ, this king, comes riding down the slopes of the Mount of Olives. Now, of course, we know that he's uh, accepted by the people, hailed as being the Messiah. And then we find as he enters the temple, which is straight up above as you ascend now the next mountain, which is the mountain of Moriah, where Abraham offered up his son Isaac. He's rejected immediately by the priests and the religious leaders. And then that began the week of the crucifixion, which we're celebrating beginning uh, today. If you look back in chapter 2 of Zechariah, this is another word of encouragement from Zechariah to Israel that they should also sing and rejoice about another event with Jesus, and that would be the second coming of Christ. Zechariah 9.9 9 is the first coming. He comes uh, just, bringing salvation, lowly and meek. But now in chapter 2, look at what it says here. In verse 10 of chapter 2 of Zechariah, it says, Sing and rejoice again, O daughter of Zion. This hasn't happened yet. This is still future. This is the second coming of Christ. Jesus said it over in Luke 24 that there were two comings. And the first, he would come lowly. He'd come meek. He would suffer. He would die. He'd be rejected. The second coming, he comes in all of his power and all of his glory to rule and reign on the planet. Zechariah 2, verse 10 says, Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I what? I come. This is the second coming of Christ, if you're writing in your margin. And what does he say he will do? I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. Jesus will actually come and dwell here on the earth in the midst of the nation of Israel and rule over them as his king. But the king was rejected at the first coming and so therefore his kingship over Israel has been postponed until he comes a second time. And then it says here in verse 11, And many nations shall be uh, joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. It talks about people all around the world who will come to know Christ during the tribulation period, who will be the subjects during that kingdom of Christ here on the earth. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, verse 11, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me, that's Jesus, unto thee. Isn't it interesting here? We have uh, the Lord of hosts being God the Father. The me here in verse 11 is Jesus. And we find here that he is, of course, addressed as being God in verse 10. I will dwell, verse 10, in the midst of thee, saith the Lord. So the one who's speaking is claiming to be the Lord who would dwell in the midst of them. And then in verse 12 we have here that the Lord of hosts, which is God the Father, would send Jesus, God the Son, the second member of the Godhead. Isn't that incredible? For people who say, where is Jesus in the Old Testament? Or where is the Trinity in the Old Testament? Obviously they are not paying attention. It says here in verse uh, 12, and the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose what? Jerusalem again. There's a battle going over, uh, over on over Jerusalem uh, today, Saudi Arabia, and about 22 Arab nations are now making a proposal that if they just give Jerusalem over to the Arab nations, that they'll sign a peace treaty recognizing Israel forever and being at peace with them. Of course, I don't believe any treaty they signed would be kept. But it's interesting, they want Jerusalem badly. But the Lord says it's his city and he's going to choose Jerusalem again. Then it says in verse 13, be silent, O all flesh, because Christ will rule over the whole earth at his second coming. It says, be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. That is, of course, the temple in Jerusalem where he will come back to rule the earth from. It's interesting that in many churches they sing a prelude to the worship service 
and they use this verse as a text to sing and they really are trying to tell the congregation be quiet now we're going to have church but actually it's out of order because this is telling the whole earth to be silent at the second coming because when Jesus comes up out of his temple to speak the whole earth needs to listen because you're talking about listening to the God of the universe Jesus Christ who will rule the earth and speak from Jerusalem and so when he speaks everybody needs to be quiet listen to what God has to say it's an exciting passage and so Zechariah <clears throat> really encourages Israel at their lowest point we now want to go back to Exodus we're going to drop back to the time when Moses was found in the basket and he was raised up to be the deliverer a type of Christ who would deliver Israel out of Egypt there were ten plagues the last of which was obviously the straw that broke the camel's back as it was a plague that would bring death on Egypt and all of those in Egypt would have their firstborn die that night when the angel came through on this tenth plague and the Lord of course gave Israel the plan of redemption that would be the redemption of the whole earth and he tells them about how a lamb needed to be slain and his blood had to be shed and by the way in 1st Corinthians 5 7 I'm not going to turn there but if you want to mark it down 1st Corinthians 5 7 it says for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us and that's written in a letter to Gentiles the Corinthian letter Paul writes and so he's not only the Jewish uh, uh, lamb uh, the, uh, the Jewish nation's lamb but he's our lamb he's the lamb that would be slain for the sins of the world John the Baptist when he saw Christ said behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sin not of Israel but the sin of the whole world Christ came to die for everyone who would ever live Jewish or Gentile and now it says in chapter 12 and the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt so this is when Israel was still in Egypt as slaves to Pharaoh this month shall be the beginning of months that was in about March April where we are right now and that's when the Passover would occur every year it is set by the lunar calendar that the Jewish people went by that's why it slides back and forth every year this year it begins tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. now uh, in the uh, week that Christ was crucified we believe it began on Wednesday at sundown and it was Thursday it's actually Tuesday but it begins tomorrow night at sundown because the Jews count their night first so this would be the Passover and it would happen in the first of the year now the Jewish people today have their new year in in the fall and of course they have switched it to a civil new year as opposed to the religious new year that God gave them they were to celebrate their new year when they came out of Egypt it was in the spring and that's when he had them celebrate the Passover first where in Egypt and it was there uh, a picture of their redemption not only from Egypt but also a picture of the redemption of the world through Christ's death at Calvary this month verse 2 shall be unto you the beginning of months it shall be the first month of the year to you Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. Now, the tenth day was when Israel was to take a lamb out to be sac sacrificed for the Passover. Guess what? Today would be the tenth day of the month when Jesus came down the slopes the people recognized that Jesus was the Messiah they said Hosanna to the son of David they said and the scripture was quoted from Zechariah behold your king cometh and so here Christ was now separated out as being the lamb that would be slain for the nation of Israel as the Passover was coming up real close Remember, six days before the Passover, he goes to Bethany. Word spreads. And now, on the tenth day of that month, he comes down the slopes of the Mount of Olives, and he's hailed as being the Messiah by the nation of Israel. But then he goes into the temple, 
and they reject him and begin to plot his death from that moment on. And so let's look at the text here is what it says. It says, notice in verse 5, Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep and from among the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day. Now, if you look at my chart that we had in the bulletin today, the 10th day would be today, Palm Sunday. The 14th day would have been Thursday. And we find that the lamb was to be separated out. And notice here, it says the lamb should be without blemish. In other words, it had to be without fault, without sin. And what happens now after Palm Sunday? The next couple of days are an examination of this lamb, Jesus Christ. He's examined by the Pharisees, by the Sadducees, by the Herodians, and by almost every ism and asm and spasm in Israel. He's then betrayed. He's taken to Caiaphas, and then to Annas, and then back to Caiaphas, and then to Herod. And all of this is taking place in the middle of the night before he's taken before Pilate in the morning, we believe, Wednesday morning before 6 a.m. And Pilate also interrogates Jesus. And what does he say? I find no fault in this man. Wow. So here, being separated on the 10th day, examined before the 14th day, found to be without blemish and without fault, Jesus Christ is the sinless Lamb of God that was to be slain. And in exact fulfillment of the picture here, he was also a male as he had to redeem mankind and Adam sinned. And so Christ as a man, the God-man, redeemed mankind. Verse 6 says, You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. <clears throat> and notice... We have here uh, the congregation claiming, crucify him, crucify him. And then he was slain in the evening. Now the evening is the twilight of the day between 3 and 6 p.m. And therefore, the crucifixion had to occur on the day prior to the uh, Passover because the night is counted first. And the evening would be the preceding afternoon. So if you're having trouble figuring it all out, Thursday was the Passover. It began at 6 p.m. Wednesday night. But the evening of the Passover would be on Wednesday between 3 and 6. And when did Christ die? He died at 3 in the afternoon on Wednesday, exactly when Israel would be offering up their lamb. Now some people say, well, how can that be when the disciples and Christ observed the Passover the previous evening, which we believe that they had the Passover on Tuesday night. And then they went out to the garden and Judas betrayed him. And it was Wednesday morning at 6 a.m. He's before Pilate. How can that be? <clears throat> well, it says here in the evening, but the Hebrew actually reads between the evenings. God made it so that all of this could be fulfilled. And between the evenings means it could have been offered up on Tuesday afternoon at 3, or it could have been offered up Wednesday at 3, because the evening of the preparation day was Tuesday at 3, and that's when they slew their lamb and they had the Passover that evening. Or it could be slayed the actual afternoon of the preparation day, which or the Passover, which would be the afternoon of the preparation day at 3 o'clock. I hope I haven't confused you with all this, but it allows, and there is no contradiction, because it allows for two times when the Passover could be legitimately offered, and it's between the two afternoons, between the evenings. And that's exactly what happened. He observed the Passover with his disciples on the first afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, and then the next afternoon when Israel was offering up their lamb, uh, he himself was offered up as the Lamb of God. And so what does all this mean? It means that the Bible all ties together. That the death of Christ not only was foretold in many, many Old Testament passages, but we find that he was literally the fulfillment of this tenth plague where the angel of the Lord came through Egypt at midnight. And all those who had taken a lamb and slain it 
and applied it to their doorpost of their home would be spared when the Lord would come through. And basically, He is our Passover in that when you trust Christ as your Savior, when God comes in judgment one day, He passes over everyone who has put their trust in the blood of the Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ. Look, if you will, at verse 12. God says, I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both of man and of beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Verse 13, And the blood, the blood, I hope you mark it, the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where you are. When I see what? Not your good works, not the fact that you were baptized or a church member. It says, when I see the blood, I will what? Pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. So the blood is the re uh, means of redemption. And that's the theme of the whole Bible. It says in Revelation 1.5, Under Christ who loved us, who washed us from our sins in his own blood. You cannot get away from the blood in the Bible. It is the means of our salvation. And so then it says in verse 14, This day shall be for you unto you for a memorial. You shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. And what was happening? Six days before Passover, Jesus goes back to the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And there they have a meal. Who's sitting at the table but Lazarus who had been raised from the dead. The word of it spread throughout all the land. People came from all over before Passover to see Lazarus and to see Jesus. And when he walks down the slopes of the Mount of Olives, the crowds are gathered to see this spectacle. And they cried out, Hosanna to the son of David. They took the palm branches and cut them down and strawed the way. And they took their coats and threw them down to prepare the way. And the disciples went and ask for the loan of a donkey that Christ could walk down this uh, slopes on. And our group got to experience that. And as we were halfway down, we stopped where is at least the traditional spot where Christ weeps over Jerusalem because they rejected him and he knew they would. And he said, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings but you would not. So Israel rejects her Savior. Christ announces that he's going to leave the planet. He's going to allow himself to be killed, to be crucified, and then he would come back again from the dead. But then he would come a second time and fulfill the other uh, prophecies about his coming to rule and reign on this earth. Let me tell you, all of these things are today under attack. I mean, Christianity is under attack like it has never been before. And uh, even the second coming, a major attack today. I know Hank Hennegraff has written a new book called Armageddon Code. He says Christ has already returned in AD 70. Yes, he was crucified and buried and rose again from the dead, but he's coming back. Uh, he's already come back. It's already happened. Armageddon has already happened. That's what his book Armageddon Code is all about. Amazing how... We're seeing the major doctrines of the Bible assaulted by uh, major players out there today. It's amazing, isn't it? It's just amazing to me. How can this happen? And how can people buy into these things? But they do. Let's go now back to the New Testament. And we find that Jesus now is offered up and dies on the cross of Calvary for your sin and for mine. And then he is buried, and he rises again from the dead. I want to go to John's Gospel, chapter 10. And in John, chapter 10, we have here Jesus saying, as he comes to Israel, and he knows that he will be rejected of them, he says in verse 16 of John 10, page 1129, Other sheep... I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. He's talking here about the Gentiles. 
Here he comes to Israel, knows that he's going to be rejected, and now announces that he's going to include the Gentiles in one body with the Jews. That's the church. And that's exactly what happened at Pentecost. Jews and Gentiles combined in one body, and there's this other fold of Gentiles that need to be saved that would be included in the body. Then it says here in verse... Uh, 17, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life. So here now Christ knows he's rejected and he says, I lay down my life that I might what? Take it again. No one else here has that power. You know, you can't say, I'm going to lay down my life and then I'll, I'll, I'll take it up again. I'll come back from the dead in a few days. I'll see you uh, alive again. Nobody else can do this, only Christ. Verse 18, No man taketh my life from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power what? To take it again. So Christ is saying here, I have the power to lay my life down, and I have the power to raise it back up again from the dead. Amazing, isn't it? And this is obviously before he goes to the cross, he's telling us what he's going to do. So Jesus, being the Lamb of God, is now going to offer himself up exactly when the Passover lamb of Israel is being offered at 3 o'clock on uh, the day or the afternoon or the evening of the Passover, which would be the preceding afternoon. And so Christ was brought before Pilate before 6 a.m. At 6 a.m., Pilate says, I find no fault. He says, Behold the man. I find no fault in him. And of course they cry out, that they wanted him crucified. And Pilate caves in and gives the decree. At 9 o'clock, they're at the hill of Calvary, and they nail him to the cross. For six long hours, Christ hung on that cross until at 3 in the afternoon, he dies. And he's the one that picked the time because it says there, he dismissed the spirit from his body. He totally controlled exactly when he would die. And on the cross, he died exactly when the twilight or the evening of the Passover began so that he could fulfill the scripture about his death that he would die when Israel was to offer up their lamb. And so it says he dismissed his spirit. And then shortly he died physically and he died spiritually and physically uh, right there around 3 o'clock on the button. It was a very hurried burial. They had to take the body down. They had to prepare it. They had to get it in the grave before sundown. That's when the Passover began. And we saw our group remarked about how close it was. So they didn't have more than 150 feet to go between where the cross was and where the body was to be laid in the tomb. So they took it down. They prepared it, and they didn't have very far to go. You know, talk about three hours to do a, a funeral. Uh, that's what they had to do. They had to get the body off the cross. They had to prepare it for burial and place it in the tomb and uh, close the tomb up uh, by 6 p.m. Three hours is not a whole lot of time to do a funeral service. But they had to get the body down before sundown. And so at sundown, he was placed in the grave. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 40, that he would be three days and three nights in the grave. So that means if he's placed in the grave at sundown, he has to come out at sundown. There's just no way to get around it. And what is interesting is that it's the end of the Sabbath and it's the very beginning of the first day of the week. Now you talk about a possible contradiction. In some passages it says that Christ was raised on the third day. And then you'll find other passages that says he was raised after the third day. How can you resolve that? And that was a puzzling problem for me when I was a new believer looking at that. And I said, how, how does that make sense? Well, the only way it can make sense is if Christ rose exactly when the third day ended and exactly when the fourth day began. And then it harmonizes. And I think that's what God is telling us in those passages. That it was exactly at the moment that the Sabbath ended and exactly at the moment the fourth day began, which Sunday night begins first, just like the Passover night begins before the Passover day. And so Christ fulfilled it to the letter. And in the morning, they discovered what? An empty tomb. The angels said to the women, what, what are you doing here? They had all their spices prepared. 
And when they got to the tomb, what were they looking for? A body. It says in Luke 24, they went in, the stone had been rolled away, and they found not the body. They found not the body. It doesn't say they didn't find a resurrected Christ. They weren't even looking for Christ to come back from the dead. It says they found not the body. They were looking for a body. They had spices to finish the burial. It had been so hurried. They weren't coming to see a resurrection. In fact, what you see on Sunday morning is a picture of unbelief by everybody. Then the angel said, you know, he's risen just like he told you. And they remembered the words of Christ and, oh, wow. And then they went and told the 11 disciples, you know, Judas was dead at this time. He'd already committed suicide. And it says, and their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Well, you thought the apostles, those are the spiritual ones. Were, well, of course, well, Christ said he'd come back from the dead. We believe that. It says that they didn't believe the words that he had come back from the dead, that the angels had told the women and they seemed as idle tales, and they believed them not. What I'm saying here, it seems like everybody had to be convinced against their will of the resurrection. They did not come in faith believing Christ would be risen when they got there in the morning. The apostles didn't believe it. The women didn't believe it. And yet the evidence was compelling, and the angels' statements was overwhelming and they believed that truly Christ had risen from the dead. Amazing, isn't it? And of course, we can go back here and be uh, our 21st century quarterbacks and say, boy, how could they possibly have missed it? And we can say that, but yet would we have done differently in the same circumstances? When they prepared that body, it didn't seem possible that life could ever re-enter it. It was bloodless, lifeless, deadly wounds, you could even transfuse blood in and it would leak right back out. Five terrible, deadly wounds in that body. And how could that body ever live again? Jesus said, I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to raise it up again. And he says, nobody takes my life from me. Can you imagine? As horrible as the crucifixion was, ultimately we find that Christ himself is the one who gave his life. And he's the one that raised it back from the dead. But we're all responsible because he died for every one of us in the human race. Other sheep have I that are not of this fold, the Jewish fold. And he says, I'm going to bring them and make them one fold. And so what happens after his death? It opens the door to us Gentiles. And we, along with the Jews, are made one sheepfold with one shepherd. Now look down at verse 28. Christ says, I give unto them what? Temporary life. No, I give it to them, verse 28, eternal life. Eternal life. I've had a fellow call me this week from Orlando. Uh, after radio was over, we just chatted for a minute. He said, he says, I don't know. He says, how can I know that Christ will not leave me now that I'm saved? And guess what? I said, I have the answer for you. He said in Hebrews 13, 5, I'll never leave you. So he's never going to leave you. It's that simple, isn't it? He said, thank you. He said, I feel so much better. But a lot of churches teach that Christ will come and go. He'll leave you. Save one day. Lost tomorrow. Their philosophy is you must be born again and 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 again. Impossible. Once you're saved, you're saved forever. And... Uh, how appreciative. I think he'll be here next Sunday. He said, I'm going to try to come over that for that resurrection service of yours. And uh, how wonderful. I hope he will do that. But Christ says in John 10, 28, I give unto them eternal life. The next phrase, I hope you'll mark it, and they shall never, never means never, never perish. That really means if you want to put it in the margin, you'll never go to hell. As a believer, you can say, I will never go to hell. To perish means physical death and the second death, which is to be cast into the lake of fire. Revelation 20.14 says they were cast into the everlasting lake of fire. This is the second death. Christ said, if you're a believer, you'll never perish. A believer will never go to hell. Well, that's the best news I ever heard. And am I excited to be able to say to people, I'm never going to see hell's fire. I will never be cast into hell. Nor will you. Christ said it. You'll never perish. And then lastly, he says, neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. 
you're in the hand of Christ at the moment of belief and you'll never be plucked out by anyone. Uh, it's impossible to be lost because Christ holds you in his hand and keeps you safe forever. It's great news and that's what it's all about. I wish we had more time because I get so excited about this week I could just go on for weeks. We'd have to just camp out. But we'll, we'll, we're going to let you go home. Uh, but uh, it is exciting. I hope you'll read some of the passages for yourself. But uh, it's interesting how that it was the time of the Passover. Six days before, Christ goes back to Bethany, and there was sitting at the table Lazarus, raised from the dead. And he was the crowning miracle of the life of Christ. And the religious leader, leader said, we want to kill this Lazarus because look at what's happening. Doggone it. Everybody's leaving us, and they're going to follow now and believe on Jesus. And then we're going to have to kill Jesus too because look at what he's caused to happen here. And so they wanted to get rid of him. Not realizing this was all a part of God's plan. And here was the Messiah in their midst, their king. Zechariah had said, you ought to be singing and rejoicing. Because your king cometh unto you. He's just and having salvation, lowly and meek, riding upon an ass, fulfills it to the letter. But they missed it. They missed it. They missed it. And look at how many in the world today are missing who Jesus is and what he's done. We have the opportunity to, to tell people, and hopefully we would share this news. If you just give out a track, uh, you're doing a job, I'll tell you. These tracks we have work, and we see people getting saved through them. And I hope you'll give them out or pass them out or mail them out or whatever you do. And just keep some in your purse or in your shirt pocket and have one ready when an opportunity arises to give somebody the, the track. Just say, read this at your leisure. And uh, I think you'll find that God will really bless you for that. Let me just illustrate, and uh, thank you, Mike, for bringing me a clean piece of paper for my illustration. I usually struggle to get that. I'm going to let this hand represent everyone here. I'll let my hymnal represent sin. Place it on my hand to illustrate the fact that we're all sinners. God loves us, hates our sin, wants us to enter heaven. But our sin would prevent us from entering God's perfect heaven. If we paid for our sin, it would be by separation from God in hell. That's not acceptable, is it? I don't think anybody wants to go to hell. How many would like to go to hell when you die? I don't see any takers. It doesn't look like anybody here is wanting to go to hell. Well, if you try to be saved by your works and your deeds and being religious and prayers and so on, uh, you will be in hell. Whether you like it or not, that's where you're headed. We need a Savior. My other hand representing Christ He's God who took on flesh. He's sinless. And he, and by the way, I'll let this clean piece of paper represent his sinlessness or his righteousness. And what the Bible says that, that happened at the cross was our sins were taken by God and laid upon Christ as he died as the substitute sacrifice. He was buried. He rose again from the dead. When you trust that he did that for you, then God exchanges for your sin and trades and credits your account with his righteousness. The believer is seen by God as righteous. It's hard to believe it, that God could look at you and me and see us as though we had never sinned. But that's the good news about the gospel message, that we are saved and saved forever. I got a nice uh, surprise. I had several nice surprises when I got back. I thought, how could the trip get any better? How could we have more blessings than uh, we had? But Wednesday, I went to the downtown study that I have on the top of the county center. And uh, that morning on the radio, I mentioned about teaching down there years ago. And as I gave the gospel, a lady just blurted out, that's good news. And everybody there knew what happened. And they, uh, they broke into spontaneous applause. They knew she understood the gospel on the spot as we were presenting it. Anyway, uh, this lady, now living with her husband in Hickory, North Carolina, said that she saw me on television, and she sent an email to the lady who had invited her out to that Bible study and says, tell Hank, I'm the one that said, that's good news. <laughs> and, uh, and then she says, tell him that I'm still serving and going at it and loving it. She said over the past four years, she's had opportunity to go to Romania and has been able to present the gospel to about 4,000 people. And I said, wow, one lady getting saved, just a simple presentation, good news. 
And she's still cranking. She says, <laughs> she's still witnessing. And can you imagine just leading one and what that one could do and going and spreading the gospel among 4,000. Wow, what another blessing to hear about how, what can happen when you lead someone else to Christ and what they might do in their life as they continue to share that gospel. That, is, that was good news. I'll tell you, had me uh, floating around on Wednesday uh, to hear that one. And last Sunday, uh, we had a blessing. After the service, a man met me outside and said, with tears in his eyes, I came by to thank you. He said, I listened to your program for two and a half years, and I've become saved. He says, I am a sixth generation Jehovah's Witness. And not just that. He said, I've been trained in their schools, and I have traveled all over the world representing the Witness Movement in at least 80 countries. His last lecture was to 80,000 Jehovah's Witnesses in Seattle on the West Coast. But he and his wife turned in their resignation. And he says, I had committed the unpardonable sin. I said, what's that? I listened to one of your shows. <laughs> and he said, I felt like you had something to offer. And I continued to listen. And after two and a half years, I got saved. Whoa. When you go fishing for men, most of us are minnows. I think this was a big one to reel in. You know? <laughs> and uh, we'll be talking further. But uh, wow, what a, what a story to hear. You never know who's hearing, who's listening, and who might uh, uh, really go forward with this message and reach others. And I hope uh, you'll pray. I think time is running out. Don't you see Iraq? Uh, a problem, and I ran now in our face with these hostages. Uh, I'm telling you, it's going to be showdown with nuclear weapons in the near future. I don't think this uh, world has much time left till Jesus returns. And what are we going to do? Sit back and just watch it happen? Say, oh, well, it's inevitable. We're going to just take whatever comes. I don't think so. I think we ought to be aggressively reaching out with this message while we have the opportunity to do it because the day is coming when our opportunity to, to win people to Christ will be closed when we go out at the rapture. Uh, this is a time we need to get serious and uh, as believers say, how can I participate? How can I give out? And, and basically the simplest way is to take that track and just hand them out. And uh, we did all over Israel. Uh, they were everywhere. Some of our people were real clever. They found out that the where you put that little plastic in your hotel door to open the door electronically, it, the track felt, felt, uh, fit nicely. And I'd walk down the hall and I'm looking, wow, there's a heaven track, there's a heaven track. And they had to remove it to put the key in to get in, so they had to touch it. And they probably carried it into their room. That was really clever. I don't know who, who started that, but I think our hotel had a heaven track in every, in every door slot. That was exciting. And other clever ideas. I found tracks wherever I went. And I said, somebody in my group has beat me uh, to it. They were everywhere. Isn't that wonderful? And so we were excited. People that weren't evangelizing, evangelizing, evangelizing. On the airplane, I'm going down the road. And uh, we had a, a doctor that went with us. And she said, get any more of those tracks? I'm getting these people right here now. I'm out of tracks. I gave her a couple of tracks. And she's continued her witness with those. And so we just... Uh, had a wonderful time. And the Lord uh, got us back safe and we are glad to be back here with you. Let's pray. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. My friend, where would you go if you were to die? You that are watching on the internet right now, uh, wherever you might be, what about you? If you were to die right now, where would you go if you were to die? And if you didn't have a good answer, if you didn't know, chances are maybe you've never really understood the plan of salvation until today. Maybe this is the first time you've heard it, that if you trust Christ, that you'll not perish, you'll have everlasting life. And you can be sure of it from the moment you believe. Would you do that right now? Whisper that prayer between you and the living God. Just tell him, God, I am a sinner. I don't understand a whole lot, but I believe Jesus died for me. I believe he paid for my sins in full by his death and shed blood. I believe he was buried. I believe he came back again from the dead. 
I believe he's alive now and forevermore. I trust Jesus Christ right now as my Savior to forgive my sins, to give me the gift of eternal life, that I might live with him in heaven forever. Whisper that prayer. If you're looking for a feeling, don't. We have God's promise, which is better. God's not going to trick you, not going to mislead you. Uh, what you're hearing is the truth from God himself, that whosoever believeth in Christ would not perish, but have eternal life. Trust him. Just whisper that prayer. Lord, I am a sinner, but I trust Jesus right now as my Savior to save me, to forgive me, to give me the gift of everlasting life. And the Lord does. And if you're looking for a feeling, you might be misled. You have God's word, and you can't go better than that. If God said it, and you believe it, my friend, that settles it, and it's eternal. It's the best news you're ever going to hear. While heads are bowed and eyes are closed and no one is looking, if you came today and were not sure of eternal life and you just now prayed this prayer and accepted Christ as your very own Savior, God up in heaven knows He saves you, but I'm going to want to include you if I can in my closing prayer as we're going to be dismissed in just a moment. And while no one is looking on purpose, we're going to do this while heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And I'm going to be the only one looking. And if you prayed that prayer just now and trusted Jesus as your Savior, as we spoke about, God up in heaven knows and He's the one that saves you. But I'd like to be able to include you as I close and pray for you without identifying you. We'll not put you on the spot. No one's going to have you come forward. No one's going to come grabbing your shoulder. They won't even know because no one is looking but me. And so while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer just now, and trusted Christ as your Savior, would you lift your hand and let me see? And then we're going to close. Are there any that would say, I did that today? God bless you, sir. Yes. All right, you can put it down. Anybody else? I trusted Jesus right here this morning as my Savior. Slip your hand up and put it down. Anyone else? Sometimes it's difficult for me to see your hand unless you raise it up real tall. But I'm not going to have you forward. No one's going to point you out. Uh, I'd like to include you. Anybody else that would say, I did that, lift your hand high, and then we're going to quit. All right, well, Lord, we thank you for this one that by the hand has indicated he trusted you as his Savior right here this morning in our worship service. And we're grateful. We Lord, pray, Lord, for those on the Internet right now. Maybe some of those right now have prayed that prayer and trusted Christ as Savior. Maybe you can email us or write to us and let us know if you made that decision. We would uh, be... Uh, really thrilled to hear about you coming to know Christ through the internet and uh, the fact that we can broadcast this message around the world right now live and then put it in archive for people to watch again later. Bless our church. Bless this week. We pray it might be exciting for us. Pray that we could just each day take a look at what happened 2,000 years ago during the crucifixion week. Help us see the connection between Genesis, Exodus, and and the latter part of the Bible, that it's all connected. It's the same story of your love and that Christ came as the Lamb that was to be slain to pay for our sins and the sins of the whole world, that all that would believe or trust on Christ would not perish but have everlasting life. Bless each one who came today and our church in its efforts to reach out with this message. In Jesus' name, amen.